Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Flutterwave product webinar session. Um, it's March special edition themed, thriving as a small business owner in a challenging economy. Thank you so much for joining. We are super excited to have you here. My name is Bisade Adiolu. I lead the internal communications here at Flutterwave and I'm your host for today. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is a very special edition. It's the month of March and is International Women's History Month. So shout out to all women out there. We are super excited to have you here. Um, this session will be very, very insightful. The one you will never forget in a very long time. I can promise you that. So please tell your loved ones to join. I'm sure you can tell with our line of um, speakers, these are fire brands. You must have seen their content on Instagram, X or even LinkedIn. Um, I'll be reading out their biography shortly as, and I'll be starting with um, Adrat Aboladi. Adrat Aboladi is the founder and CEO of Amila Naturals, followed by a passion and African storytelling with a background in brand strategy. She birthed Amila to disrupt the global beauty industry by promoting increased transparency of ingredient sourcing, accessibility of products, and responsible environmental practices. Please let's welcome Adrat Aboladi. Um, now I'll be moving to Yinka Anidube Olaniyo. Yinka Anidube Olaniyo is a seasoned professional, author, and entrepreneur, founded Sweetpod in a kitchen during COVID-19 lockdown. This venture marries a technology background with a passion for creating health-conscious ready food mixes, making Sweetport a globally recognized brand that started with a simple yet innovative idea. Love that. Um, okay, now I'll be reading the biography for Morenike Mulane. Morenike Mulane is the founder and creative director of Oak Antique, a full service interior design under a leadership the company has achieved a prominent status as a leading interior design enterprise globally with influence that extends across various countries, including Dubai. Um, welcome, Yinka. Welcome, Moreni K. And welcome, Adrat. So I guess we can start um, with the panel session now. Okay. Um, let me spotlight them. So our theme for today, um, like I mentioned earlier, is striving as a small business in a challenging economy. Um, Papa, please, can you stop sharing the screen? Let's spotlight the speakers, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, so my first question is um, to all the panelists, but I'll be starting with uh, Morenike. Hi, Morenike. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And to my amazing co-panelists, I'm humbled to be speaking alongside you. Thank you, Doe, for having me. Thank you so much. Hi, Adrat. Hello, everyone. Nice to have me here. Okay. Hi, Yinka. Good afternoon. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here learning and sharing with fellow business owners, um, and I hope we have a fantastic session. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, okay. So my first question um, is for all the panelists, and I'll be asking um, Morenike first. How did you get into the business you do? And given the current economic condition, would you have started this business today? Okay, so um, my name is Morenike, and uh, I'm the founder of Ocantic. Ocantic is an interior design company, you know, that specializes both in residential and commercial spaces. And we have been in, you know, we're running the business for 11 years. So this year, June, we will be 11 so for me, I would say that I stumbled into interior design based off on, you know, um, my background growing up. So growing up, um, I lived in a house where my mother, you know, was like the interior person, but she didn't 
pursue it as a business. So my mom is that person that we come to a house in January. If we come again in April, the house has already changed. Like you are, you're like, oh, by the way, uh, this was not here the last time I came. And so we grew, I grew up in that kind of environment. My mom was always changing, you know, things, furniture pieces, adding here and there, removing. And so that, so that auntie in the family as well, that when any, anyone wants to build a house, my uncles, my aunties, they would call her and say, you know, Miss, could you help us, you know, in terms of putting a house together? But she didn't used to charge anybody at the time. So I grew up, you know, in that environment. And I think unconsciously, those seeds kind of like deposited in me. And so when I just recently got married, so because I had I have two degrees in mathematics, right? And I was then working in a consulting firm. So I did up our space at the time, you know, um, a three-bedroom flat in MVI at the time, 1004. And everyone will come to the house and they'll be like, oh my goodness, your house is so beautiful. Your house is so pretty. For me, it was just something in quotes, like very easy. Like I just put them, put it together. Like I didn't even go to school for it. I didn't even check the internet or anything. And, you know, I would get that compliment not once, not twice, not three times, not five times. My husband said, you know what? It's like, this thing is really, you know, I think that you should consider it as a business. And I'm like, me, as I'm like, I'm very quiet. I'm gentle. I'm calm. I don't think I can do business. So I just want to go into the corporate world, you know, corporate body <laughs> and, you know, climb the corporate world. And the business is not for me because in my, in my my idea of business at the time was that business, you have to be very you have to be violent, like, you know, you have to, like, it's for people in the streets. Um, and so my husband was like, you know, why don't you just start it? Even if it's six months and you, you are not enjoying it, at least you know. Because again, you know that sometimes you're passionate about something, but when it comes to the business of that thing, the business of your passion, is it, is there are two completely different things, right? If you're not careful, that part, that business of that passion can actually break you down. And so I said, okay, no problem. What's the worst that can happen? Six months, if I'm not fine, at least, if, I, if I'm not good at, at least I know that I tried. Thankfully, 11 years after, we are still here going strong and get, and getting bigger. So that's how I entered into interior design. But along the line, you know, I've been able to like, you know, take courses and also improve myself um, along the line. Now, if I, if I was to start a business now, you know, but you know, the thing about Nigeria is that every time that you think about Nigeria's economy, you feel like that's the worst that can happen at that particular time. So right now, at that time, it was like, oh my God, you're starting business. Even the dollar was still like around 150, 170-ish that time. What I would give for the dollar to be 170 right now. Um, but at the time, it seemed like the economy was in shambles. The economy was this, when was that. But we started and we are thriving today, right? I feel like if we had to, if it was this time, I will still go for it, right? Because the market is there, the demand is there. As long as there's demand, as long as there's um, supply, you have um, business. So I would say that uh, if it was, if I was still in this, if it was I was starting now, I would still go for it. I mean, I might have like a different strategy, but I'll still go for it. Thank you very much, Marenike. So what I got from that was um, you were very passionate. You are very, very passionate about what you do. Um, hi, Yinka. So I would, I would be asking you the same question too. How did you get into the business you do? And given the current economic conditions, would you have started it today? Um, for me, right, um, getting into what I'm doing today is actually by accident, I'll say that. Because considering my background in computer science with economics, and I worked in a multinational corporation selling telecom solutions. Actually, I started as an engineer, and then I started selling telecom telecommunications solutions to the banking sector. Um, and I did that for, I mean, for a very long time, close to 10 years, and I was very successful with it. I worked with brands like UBA and all of that, you know, um, spreading them into Africa. Food was the last thing on my mind. In fact, my mother till date still does not understand how my degree in tech has translated to food. She asked me that question almost every time, as in, what are you doing with that degree, by the way? You're now into food. Now, I got into um, Sweet Pod uh, during the pandemic, okay? And like I said, maybe if it wasn't the pandemic, maybe I wouldn't have started Sweet Pod at all. Because when the pandemic happened, something had to change, you know, we're shut down for, a, I mean, for a long time. And I was just thinking, okay, what else will I do? And there I had my children saying, mommy, we talked about this food thing. And I'm like, who's going to do food? No, I'm not doing food. I'm a tech person. I don't, I don't want to do food. Food is not for somebody like me, you know? And over, I mean, over time, I just said, what if this idea is something that can actually turn into something? 
So at that point in time, I decided to take my pancake mix, which was legendary with my family, my children, and I put it in the bag. And I sent the first pack to a friend. And I went to bed. It was daytime. I mean, we did a lot of sleeping during COVID. And when I woke up, she had put it on her Instagram page. And she had sent me a lot of text messages saying, this is the best she's ever had. Um, it's just wonderful. You have to do this and all of that. And for me, the lesson I have learned from that is everybody has a gift. Everybody has something that they're passionate about. And it might look like a stupid idea, but I beg you in the name of God, try and fan it because you don't know how and where it would take you. I'm here on this panel because of something that started in my kitchen in 2020 during the pandemic. If you ask me back then, would this happen? Would I be doing this today? I'll tell you no. I just took a chance. And the chance has actually paid off. Now, if you ask me, would I do this again? Oh, yes, I will definitely do it again. In fact, in hindsight, I should have done this a long time ago because everything does need time to grow well. But I'm still thankful to God that I'm doing this right now. And I will do it definitely again. The only thing that I will do differently is I will come at it with a lot more conviction. I'll come of it with a lot more gust. I wouldn't say it's just a simple idea that started in my kitchen. I'll come out the door banging with a lot of conviction to say, yes, let's do this. And I think um, even considering the challenging times we have right now, the economy and the challenging times we have right now, it's a good time for me to do this. Why do I say that? We need to replace all the important goods. We need to replace all the imported goods. We need to have Nigerians feed Nigerians. We need to have, um, how do I put it? We need to have products that we can trust. Like for instance, our pancake mixes, all our mixes are without additives, without GMO, without artificial ingredients, without artificial colors or flavor. Now, if you bring any pancake mix that you import into the country, please just check it. You have a two year shelf life. And really flour has a shelf life of about six months. So really, you're eating a lot of unnecessary stuff and we're feeding it to children. So I will definitely do it again and I'll do it with a lot more conviction. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really fantastic. And what, what I got out from that is um, be passionate. You have a gift, find it. And when you find it, have that conviction that you can do it. Um, Hi, Adrat. I would be asking you the same question too. You're muted. Oh, okay. So, hello, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> I think this is my first um, webinar, so it feels a bit strange. But yeah, I'm going to say, my name is Hadrat Abolade, and I'm the founder of Amila Naturals. And what we do is share butter. So for me, I had my own background, fashion. I've started my fashion brand since I was 18. And I remember when I, I went to fashion school in Abuja, then 2020, I came back to Lagos. I was supposed to, you know, start my own fashion brand. Start all over again and COVID happened and fashion was like on hold. And I was thinking, what can I do? I have a side business, which was being a brand strategy. So I love storytelling. I love African, I love black people. And all my life, the only two products, I'm not that skincare girly. I'm not the kind of person that will use moisturizer, serum and all. The only product my mom trained us with was shea butter and coconut oil. So that was the only product I was used to while I was growing up. That even among my friends, I'm always the old one out. Like, oh, you don't have a skincare routine, that's weird. So. While I was thinking, I thought about shea butter, or I, I got an inspiration from a brand in Ghana. And I was like, okay, I love this. My grandma used to sell shea butter. Oh, so I think it's something I could, you know, modernize and start doing differently. Because how do I buy shea butter? When I go to the market, they sell in um, plates. When I was in school, they sell in plates and they Put it inside a nylon so when i get home i'll have to transfer it inside a pot then i discovered the likes of shea moisture and all which was so expensive while i was in school and that was how the idea grew up and while i was starting that i wanted to solve a 
I wanted to solve a solution. I had a problem. And what was the problem? While being a brand strategist, I worked with few skincare brands to, um, I worked with few skincare brands and I saw the way they were producing skincare products. Very, most of them very harmful to the skin. And, you know, the idea keep coming, like, why can't you let people know that we have beauty, African beauty ritual that you can use and it's going to maintain your skin without harming your skin. And that was when the whole trend of, you know, bleaching the skin was so rampant as well. And I just thought about telling a different story with Shea Butter, with all the African beauty rituals we had, uh, or we have in Africa. And that was how I started Amila. And so along the line, different, we started, I started getting more clarity about the brand. How do we tell the story? Then I also, sorry, also I remembered while I was young, I don't see black people on magazine cover or on beauty products. You barely see black skin people. So I wanted a brand that a seven year old me would see and say, oh, this brand actually represents me. So my one, from my own perspective, we wanted to solve a problem. And the pro we wanted to solve a problem. We were providing solution to the African beauty space. And so that was how Amila started. And your second question was, sorry, would you have started it today? I think yes, because 60% of our, of what we are selling now, we export. So we export share butter outside the country. So 60%, if we are exporting share butter outside the country, that means we are able to generate so much income to the country as well, give people um, employment opportunities as well. So definitely, if I am to start all over again, yes, I'm going to start because because that means we are getting, we are putting all our raw materials that we have or that we are blessed with in this country. We are pushing them outside, and we are generating income from it. Thank you very much, Adrat. That was super insightful. And something I really got out was your passionate about African storytelling. Um, everyone, I told you that these are fire brands. So you can still tell your friends to join. There's actually so much to learn from these women. Okay, so my next question is um to you, um, Yinka. Uh, you started Sweetport during pandemic and you've built a very successful brand, seven individuals and businesses like Food Co across the company. What is the best way of maximizing business potential during challenging times? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, for you to be able to maximize potential of your business during challenging times, the first thing that would need to be would be the fact that you love what you do. Because if you don't love what you do, you will drop it at the slightest excuse of dropping it. So first of all, if you're, I mean, first of all, if you're a business owner and you have a business and it's a challenging time we're all passing through, the first thing you need to find, I mean, ask yourself is, do I love what I'm doing? Am I passionate about what I'm doing? Because that determines how much of yourself you put into that particular venture. Like, if you love what you're doing, like, I love what I'm doing. Why? For us at Sweetport, the fact that we are Nigerians and we're feeding Nigerians. And by the way, we export part of our products as well because we have people living in the US and the UK asking for our products. Why? Because, like I said, we have no additives, no preservatives in them. And therefore, they're a lot safer for human consumption. We don't put anything in them, you know. So I would say, first of all, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. Passion is really key because with passion, you will do everything, including throwing the kitchen sink and what you need to do. Otherwise, you will just drop it at the, I mean, at the, um, I mean, at the smallest excuse. The second thing is you need to be strategic about what you're doing. Okay. Um, I'm thankful for the fact that I had worked corporate for almost 20 years and therefore I have an idea of structure. I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly how I want to sound, how I want to project my business and where the end game is. 
Now, if you love what you're doing and you have structure behind you and it's really clear to you, you can determine your path, all right? Another thing, again, you need to do is you need to understand what value do you bring to your customers? What value do you bring to your customers? Now, for us, we have been able to, um, by God's special grace, we have been able to own our customers. I have people that started buying from us, even when we're not in supermarkets, still DMing me and making their orders, okay? And I'll still take their orders. Why? Because we are because they are. So therefore, for us, we actually, um, how do I put it? We prioritize customer experience. We prioritize customer focus. And another thing, again, that I would say you should do in challenging times is you should be able to pivot. How do I mean? You need to be able to look inwards and see what else can I do? Like when we started Sweetport, we started only with the basic classic line. How would I say? We have pancakes in made with wheat flour, which is what most people would eat. But today we have a healthy gluten-free range. That means we're into special diets. We have a gluten-free range of about eight products. We've launched some. We have some yet to be launched. That means we have gluten-free pancake mix. We have gluten-free cake mix in chocolate and vanilla. We have zero sugar, gluten-free chocolate cake mix. Why? You have some people that are diabetic. Because you're diabetic doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy the little, how do I put it, the little uh, luxuries of life, okay? Um, at the same time too, we have products for vegan people. So what am I saying? In challenging times, you can't just um, provide the basic. You need to go over and above to see what else can I do. Um, you need to be inclusive in your clientele. How do I mean, who else can I serve? Um, how do I bring additional value to my customers? And how do I that I own the last customer? Another thing you need to do, like right now for us, we're, how do I put it, we're big on retail uh, for various reasons. Um, first of all, with the help of Flutterwave, we know each and every customer that we have. We have a website, but we don't sell on our website. We only sell on Flutterwave. And I'll tell you why we sell on Flutterwave, because everybody that buys from us wants on Flutterwave, we have your name, we have your phone number, we have your location, we, we have the details of what you bought. And therefore, we can actually use those information to determine what next are we doing? I mean, where is the demand coming from? Which, I, which is why I said you have to be strategic. And because of that, we can better serve our customers. So, and at the same time, too, once you own the customer, there's a whole lot of loyalty going in there. So there's a high probability that they would probably not go to a and buy a competitor's product, they'd rather come back and still buy from you. We give discounts on some days, even though it's a bit difficult. Sometimes we give discounts, we give free delivery. What am I saying? Operational efficiencies have to come in at a time where, you, I mean, where, the, whole, um, where the whole business environment is challenging. So I think um, I've been able to share a bit on this so that other people too can add to this. Thank you. You have. Um, that was really fantastic. And even as a corporate person, being strategic is very, very important. Um, that was really insightful. Thank you very much, Inka. Um, Moranike, um, you've been described as a you've been described and recognized as one of the top Nigerian 15 interior designers, redefining your industry. How can business owners leverage this tough times and how can they carve a niche for themselves? in their industry. Hi, hi, Moronika, you are muted. <laughs> so sorry, so sorry, you know how these things are. All right, so I was saying that um, one of the things that has helped me, right, first off, aside from, you know, understanding the business of your um, passion like understanding the business of what you're doing which is extremely key sometimes people go into business and they don't know exactly they haven't done like their business plan they haven't even done like feasibility studies it's just like oh i'm passionate about this and then bam they just enter into it or oh my friend doing is doing this business and she's cashing out she's a baller and you know i feel like if i also do it 
I would also cash out. So some people go into business for the wrong reasons. However, if we have people that are, you know, you you are not in this category, but you are going in with the right, you know, intentions, with the right motive, I would say that, you know, first of all, your value proposition is extremely important. Ex make sure that value is extremely important, you know, um, as you continue to conduct your business. Another thing that has helped, I would say, is um, investing in branding and marketing. Now we are in the age where, uh, we are blessed. I always say that that we are blessed with the gift of social media. Now, in my own in my own industry, um, many years back, say fifteen years, people that started the business like say fifteen years ago, they would have to you know either maybe pay so much money for radio jingles, TV adverts, or you know carry portfolio of their work from one place to another. But now I can just you know do a beautiful project, take pictures post it somewhere in my living room or my bed, you know, chewing, chewing, chin, chin. And it has gone, you know, people in Ibadan, Portacourt, Abuja, London, China, as far as I want it, can see it instantly. Imagine the work that I would have to do to be carrying my portfolio. So we are being blessed with the gift of social media. So you owe it to yourself to market yourself, right? You owe nobody. At this, this point, now you cannot say, oh, because I don't have money, because I don't have resources. All you just need to do is to log in into, um, to register into these platforms free of charge and begin to find creative ways. So that's one thing that has helped. Another thing that has helped will be um, building solid relationships. And in networking is extremely important, right? Me, growing up or up until the time when I started business, I'm a, I'm a solid introvert. I was a solid introvert. Like, I'm just like, you know, I just want to be on my own. But then one day I realized that, ah, this I just want to be on my own. I don't want anybody to know me. It cannot help me. It won't pay me at all, right? Because people need to, people need to know people to be able to patronize them. It needs to be top of mind. Like, you know, how do you, how can, you can be in a, if you're not careful, you can be in a room and somebody needs your services, but because they don't know what you do, they can go out and find somebody else that would do it. Meanwhile, you're just like five like just inches away from them, right? So networking is extremely important. Is it easy? It's not easy. You have to be conscious about it and you have to like be, and if you cannot do it yourself, there are other ways that you can do it. But I always say that nobody can market you as much as you can, right? So that's extremely important. I would also say collaboration. Collaboration is extremely key. And as women, you know, sometimes this might be a bit, this is a conversation that, you know, I'm just, you know, hoping that we have more and more. Now, I see these comedians and all these um, content creators, and I learn from them, like they collaborate a lot. So you see like uh, a maybe, um, maybe a like wasabi from for example, collaborating with another person. So it's audience, it's draw, drawing audience from this person, drawing audience from this other person. And then, you know, their reach is farther. But most times in business, we don't want to do it. We're like, ah, you know what, well, let me just be on my own. I don't want to, you know, you can actually collaborate and there's so much beauty. But when you're collaborating, ensure that who you are collaborating with has sense. Who you are collaborating with, you can trust the person. The person is loyal. Just I think that you also then need to check. Don't, because I've said, go well, and collaborate now. Don't come and meet me and say, I collaborated with somebody and the person scammed me. I'm not there. You do your due diligence. But then, you know, because in these things, there are perks, you know, um, and then there are also, um, there are also like the bad sides. Of so, so these are some of the things that has helped. Now, I've not mentioned the other things like, you know, ex 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 make sure that, you know, your business, you're delivering excellent work. Right. So that's like because I'm saying I'm not adding that because it's a is a given, right? There's no points entering into business and excellence shouldn't be your number one um priority because that's what keeps the clients, right? Because at the end of the day, with all of these strategies that we are trying to, you know, put in our businesses, if the quality of the work is not good, you will not have people coming back. And I always say that, you know, having repeat clients is way better. Then having to always try to have new clients, new clients is beautiful. But then the work that you will do will be more than if you've already done a job for somebody and then the person is just coming. You don't even need to speak plenty of grammar. The person is already sold. There is a reason why they came back, right? Because they can already tell from the quality of the product or from the services. So it's easier to convince that kind of person if you have a product, a new product line and say, oh, you know what? Um, we had like, cookies the last time and then now we are adding we are introducing some, some something they like the cookies the last time this time around they're like of course 
if it's Inca that is doing it, <laughs> of course, it's going to be better. So they will definitely, they don't even need you to speak plenty English, right? So ensure that you're also very, very intentional about customer retention. Even if the client is not coming back, they have like their own network of people that they would um, recommend you to. Your attitude to work as well. Like, don't just say, oh, you know what? Once I'm done with this, let me just quickly finish this job I want to do. And, you know, um, you keep the relationship going. There's some projects right now that we are doing now. You are from relationships that we built 10 years ago, right? So some of these things, they have like their days where they come. But let me allow um, Adrat, Adrat, Adrat? Adrat. Yeah, Adrat, too. Adrat, yes. <laughs> Welcome. Back. Sorry, I lost my network. Sorry. No problem. Okay. Um, Adra, this question is for you. You deal directly with a customer based. Uh, is a customer base concerned with all aspects of the products they are buying? How are you able to establish um a brand that connects, engage, and creates personalized experiences for your customers? Okay, so I think the first thing is structure. Structure is very important, whether you are just starting. It might just be only you in your business. Because I remember the first year of business, it's just me and my assistant. But it feels like you're talking to like multiple people at the same time. It feels like you have a you're having a conversation with uh um what's it called? <laughs> Sorry, um logistic team. Um, we have the communication team, we have different social media team and all. Meanwhile, it was just the two of us. So what we've been able to do is to streamline it. Okay, you handle this, you handle that. So when someone reach out to us, for example, this is, we have, we have a template. So the template has guided us to the point that even when someone like, when someone is leaving the brand, for example, if we're hiring someone else, the person literally follow the same template. So we've been able to, structure is very important. I feel like what has really helped is structure. So even if it is just one person that is handling all the, all the platform, maybe Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or WhatsApp, so far there's a structure in line. So for me personally, what I'd help is putting structure in place. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so guys, you can start asking your questions in the Q&A box. Um, because of time, we have to be really fast. Um, so my question is for you, um, Ninka. Um, what are some of the reliable business tools that has really helped you to stay afloat in this economy? Thank you for that question. Um, the answer is very simple. You know, I said earlier on that we do have a website of our own, but we don't even sell on it, okay? And I'm saying this for every business owner out there or anybody that wants to start a business and you think, oh, I need to invest in a website. No, you do not need a website. You do not need a website. The only thing really that we have on our website is information about us saying about us, who we are, how we started and all of that. The only tool that we really use today, because we're still a small business, we plan to grow, we plan to be here for a very long time, to be like the Hungry Jacks and the Costus and the likes, okay? But for now, the only business tool that we use and which we started using in 2020 was Flutterwave. Um, when we started the business in 2020, I needed to do invoicing and I stumbled on the Flutterwave app and that's how I logged on to Flutterwave. So I'm using Flutterwave since. Now, I would say Flutterwave, why? First of all, you get a free online store that is 24 by 7. What does that mean? You wake up in the morning and it's actually integrated to your WhatsApp. So you wake up in the morning and you have this nice WhatsApp message, you have a new order. And it could be two, it could be three, it could be four. And it's free. Okay. And all you need to do is to hit on the link and you get into your dashboard. Now, in your dashboard, what do you have? You have a back end, you have a front end. On your back end, there you can actually create a store. Um, sometime last week, I actually found out that it has been upgraded and you have different uh, formats for the store, okay? And therefore, you can decide to choose whatever format you want for your storefront. You can even categorize your products. If you go onto our page right now, onto our Flutterwave store, you have all our products categorized as either gluten-free, vegan, or cakes, or all of that. You have it categorized, okay? Now, you have a store in which you can load your products um, you can do um, inventory, number of the quantities of the products you have, 
every time you um, you sell something, it depletes by the number of the quantity the customer buys. When the customer buys, you have their information, their name, their location. It's actually integrated as well with logistics. So it's at, like a one-stop shop for you to have a storefront. And like I said, again, it's free. Anything free, it's good. Why? Because you don't need added cost in this, in this current dispensation. Another thing, again, is you can do, you can do transfers. I use my Flutterwave app to do transfers. You can transfer to your bank. You can transfer to your customers. You can do another beautiful thing, again, about the Flutterwave store is if somebody buys something and you're out of stock, you can do a refund easily. You can do a refund easily. Just go back into your, I mean, into your store and you click on the refund and you do the refund. People can do transfers into your accounts. They can pay with the link. They can pay with transfer. You can do transfers. You can do invoicing, either simple invoice or an advanced invoice. You want it to really look te techy and all of that. You attach your logo and it looks like, hey, you had this fantastic tool you were using. You look so professional and everything is actually from your dashboard, which by the way, can be on your phone. You don't even need a computer. The app works brilliantly on your phone. So I would tell any business owner or anybody that intends to do business, why don't you have a Flutterwave store? It's free, it's fantastic, it provides you with endless possibilities. Another thing again that the Flutterwave store can do for you is, um, like I said, um, trying to like keep ahead in this challenging economy. I'm diversifying my income, okay? Um, just like Morenike, I'm somebody that doesn't like to be in front of people. I've always like, you know, just keep me in the back end. You know, I don't want anybody to see me, you know, but I can't do that. Why? Because if I have a business and I want my business to grow, I need to learn to talk to people. I need to put myself out there and I need to be uncomfortable to some extent because I even read something yesterday said, the more you should, I mean, the more successful you want your business to be, the more uncomfortable you should be in doing it. And therefore, how do I mean? Um, I, I mean, lately I dropped an ebook on how, on five steps to transform your ideas into, a, into profitable businesses. Now, when I dropped that ebook, I was thinking, how do I use my Flutterwave store to sell the ebook? All I did was I did a payment link, both in Naira and a payment link in US dollars. And therefore, anybody that wants to buy my book, I just send you the payment links. And I don't have a DOM account. I'm, no bank is asking me to bring $1,000 to open a DOM account. Everything is done on my Flutterwave store. So for me, in these challenging times, I believe, first of all, like I said earlier on, um, business owners need to be very strategic. And in being strategic, you need to ensure that you have tools that you can use such that you can see exactly what you're doing, how much you've sold, who you sold it to, how often do they buy, who can I send emails to or even um, um, or even bulk messages to say, hi, this is Sweetport, this week we're giving a 5% discount, please put in your sales before 12 noon today. People do that and they actually buy because everybody needs, um, everybody needs a small discount off or every Naira accounts at this point in time. So I would say that, um, and the last thing I wanted to add is if you're a business owner and you need a POS, Flutterwave gives you free POS, a free POS attached to your business. You don't need to like fund it every day. You don't need to put 50,000 naira down before you get one. Hey, I don't know what you're doing, but honestly speaking, do yourself a favor. If that's the only thing you do out of, I mean, after this webinar is to get yourself and sign up for a free Flutterwave account, please do. Thank you very much, Yinka. That was super insightful. And um, Yinka said it all. Flutterwave is your one-stop shop for all your business needs. Um, thank you very much, Yinka. Um, okay, so I'm really curious to ask all the panelists this question. And I'm sure that people are interested in knowing about it too. So many businesses have had to cut costs. Um, is this an approach your business has taken? If yes, in what areas have you done that? Or are you doing that? And how? So I'm going to start with Morenike. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this question uh, is very is sweet in my body. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because for some reason i don't know if it is because of as a child of god and just um you know yes the grace of god from the onset from the very beginning of my business 
I we've been operating hybrid slash virtual. So I looked at it and that was part of my strategy. And that's why I said that if you're going to start a business, make sure you sit down, right? I know that this is not a, a spiritual system, but in the Bible, right, it says that who will not, you know, want to build a house and not first sit down and count the cost. So it applies to everybody, whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, you have to sit down, count the cost, and then know whether you want to go ahead with this building project. You have what it takes. So for me, I realized, I said, you know what, I may fully base service um, company, right? And um, it doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for us to, have, that's for my own business. It wouldn't make sense for us to have like a, like an office because 90% of my um staff strength they are reporting on site so from your home to site the only two people that might be in an office space maybe like the finance officer and the head of operations right every other person my engineers my design guys everybody they are you know on site if you're going to go to the office it's just maybe once in a month and so i said okay and does it make sense because again i we live in Lagos. our headquarters is in lagos the traffic, you know, I'd rather you, you know, take that three hours because sometimes if you look at it, if you are on Tom Milan Bridge for like four hours, but then you get to work, you need like few hours, few minutes first to boot and realize that let me recalibrate and then start my day. So from the onset, we've always had like that. So when we moved into COVID, when COVID happened, you know, it wasn't a big deal for us. We continued working um hybrid um and even post covid as well so that's how we've been able to save costs we need to save costs in terms of like um you know no physical office and there's some other things that come attached to that so we only just um pay for like salaries and you know little little things here and there so that's help because i'm also a big big evangelist on ensuring that you cut costs at all costs there are some times where you have you know um, in your business, you have like really high revenues that sometimes when it's like low, it happens even in economies as well. There are times where the economy is booming and there are times where the economy is in recession. But the the good thing is that you need to always just, just have like that flat um, strategy that, okay, even if we are making billions at this time, even if we are making thousands at this time this is the level in which you're going to operate now that all oh, the money comes and then you're like all right that's when we're going to go and splurge on things you always remember that there's always like the economy circle they'll always it's not you don't need a you don't need a prophet prophets or prophetess to tell you there'll always be an up and they'll always be a down it's just that in nigeria it's just that the downs are more than the ups right so you just need to always be careful so for us that's what has really helped um, us and we always have that mindset of trying to cut costs if it's not you know, important, we can find um, alternative ways, right? Even if it's important, can we find plan B, plan C, plan D to still achieve what you want to achieve without compromising quality or standard? Sometimes because you have the money in your account, immediately you're like, oh, let's just take this route. But if you think about it, you, have, you, have you ever, I think I've caught you before sometimes that maybe you're a bit, I don't want to use the word broke, but you don't have so much money and you need to do something. You realize that you find creative ways to still yeah. get that thing that you want to get right so if you are if you have that mind well abundance mindset is great but you all in business as well you also need to have that mindset that, okay yes i have this money but it doesn't mean that i have to immediately that should be my first um my first um what's the word my first yeah, I've lost my train of thought. But yes, um, just ensure that, you know, you're always conscious about your cost and making sure that you're always financially healthy. Thank you very much, Morelli. Okay, you said something that was really funny. We tried to cut costs at all costs. Mm -hmm. I yeah, love cost that. Costs at all costs. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Adrat. Um, so I'll be asking you the same question as well. So because of time, we really have to be fast. All right, all right. So for us as a product-based brand, no, we've not been able to cost cut. Rather, what we've done, I remember in January, we had to like make so much review, like should we reduce our quanti quality or we should increase the price? And, you know, we've not done marketing. We've not done any form of marketing for the brand. What we've been able to sell in the past three years is good product so we'd rather increase the prices of the good product and still sell at the same rate and i'm going to give an example so why when, when we increased our prices in january i was trying to monitor how the sales rep are replying people 
So I saw this particular client. He has been patronizing us for like two years. Every month, he has his own order. Then they replied in that, oh, sorry, sir, we had to increase the prices. And I had to unsend the message and say, sorry, sir, we're going to give you our old price, but from next month, we're going to, um, you are going to start buying at this new rate. And the man was like, oh, no, it's fine. I'm going to buy it at the same rate because your product is good. So the most important thing is to have a very good product. When you have good product, and because we, we ship most of our packages, we ship them in from our plastic to our labels. They are shipped into the country. So we have to like calculate all those costs, dollar rates, um, cargo rates, clearing rates, and also it is not convenient for us and we don't want to reduce the quantity that we give to people. Rather, we have to increase the, the prices and make sure that we keep to that standard of products that we're offering people. Thank you very much, Adrat. Um, hi, Yinka. Uh, so same question for you. <laughs> Have you been able to um, cut costs? Okay. okay. For, for us, we haven't been able to cut costs. And it's primarily because we provide premium, premium quality products. And when you're thinking of cutting costs and you're in a product-based business, you would eventually cut the product and that kills the business. So our approach is different. What we've been able to do is to manage our costs. And in managing our costs, we're managing our costs at the same time trying to look for um, other smart ways of selling more. How do I mean? First of all, um, we don't come, I mean, first of all, for our staff, you don't have to come to work every day. So we operate a flexible shift period. How do I mean? Um, we produce on a particular day, and when you are not in production, you don't need to be. And I mean, if you don't need to come to work, you don't come to work. So we operate on a flexible schedule. That's number one. The second thing we've tried to do again is we're trying to like sell more, but now through other people. Uh, we're launching an affiliate program such that wherever you are, you can sell for us and we give you a commission of whatever you sell for us. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about costs, right? Cost is in relation to revenue, okay? So if you can increase your revenue, you probably and and you have a I mean you have you have a managed cost probably will still stay afloat. But in terms of having to cut costs, we can't cut costs in the quality of the of our inputs because then the taste changes. Immediately the taste changes, my customers will be unhappy and they go away. And I like I said, we could be around for a very long time. So our approach is to manage our costs and ensure that when we don't need to spend, we don't spend. But at the end of the day, still have the same output, which is fantastic products your ingredients, happy customers, and everybody having a sweet port experience. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Inka. Um, hi, Adrat. You mentioned something about exporting um, some of your um, products. So I would like to ask, how do you manage the ups and downs of exporting goods um, from Nigeria, especially during tough times, even importing as well? Okay. You mean exporting or importing? Sorry, I didn't get the exporting. exporting. You export exporting. your products, right? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. And you also import some products too. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so majorly, not... what we import are packaging. That's the plastic and the labels. But most of our raw materials are all in are all in Nigeria. We source our shea butter in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Togo. Uh, also black soap, castle powder, and all. So all those are sourced locally. But the major thing we have to, like we always have to import is our plastic and labels. But for exporting, yes, we export shea butter. And by the, so, sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the last question you asked. Yeah, so how do you manage the ups and downs, especially this tough period? So I think it was it was really bad in January while we're trying to import a lot of um we're trying to stock up for the year and dollar it was going and it was it was it was hard. That's that that's that's a basic truth. It was hard and that was where we had to like, okay, if this doesn't happen, we now had to start looking for an alternative. So I, I got some contract of people that produce companies that produce plastic in Nigeria, for example. How do we how do we produce plastic that look exactly like what we import into the country? 
So that's one that we've been able to like balance, like, okay, let's look inward to producing our plastic ourselves in Nigeria. That would save a lot of cost. And yeah, that would save a lot of cost. But for exporting, I mean, when you calculate exchange rate, exporting is a very good deal. So while we are exporting our raw materials that we have in Nigeria, we are making extra income and we can be able to like sustain the business and also the people that are producing, all those women that are producing our shea butter, they have access to like produce more in, they have access to produce in more quantity while we export. So for exporting is a great deal, but for importing, so that's why we are trying to look for how to balance it now, look for an alternative measure we have in Nigeria that we can balance in here. Thank you very much, Adrat. We are almost out, yes. out of time and we still have to take um, questions and answer. Okay, so my next question is for Morenike. Hi, Morenike. You've been running more than 10 years. Can you mm -hmm. share what has always been like your mental resilience in tough times? Mm -hmm. uh, as I would say, first off, is I'm always maintaining a positive mindset. Right. Um, I feel like, you know, you might just think that ah is it a big deal, but it, it is actually because what other option do you have? That's what I, well, that's what I tell myself. I remember 2020 was the first time that I seriously asked myself, do I have to continue this business? Like, and my my own challenge wasn't even from the because of COVID and we weren't getting businesses. Mine was even the opposite. So I was overwhelmed, we were overwhelmed with work. So people had stayed in their homes for six weeks, eight weeks, and then they realized that, you know, because sometimes you they go out in the, you know, in the morning before day breaks, then they come back, it's nighttime. So you were not really seeing the inner corners of your homes and you did not really realize that, ah, this my house needs some level of uplift. Or some people realize that, okay, you know what, I actually do need an home office. The situation has, you know, demanded for it or office so we just had like this so immediately the lockdown was eased we had like an influx and then at the same time because of how overwhelming it was i then had like two staff resigning back to back under 24 hours so i just sat down one day on the floor and i said i cannot do this god please this is too much they want to choke me with work and you know it seemed like a good problem but i didn't see it that way but immediately i had to like tell myself this too will pass right and just what are the what how can you solve this situation because that's the thing like instead of complaining you need to get into the mood of okay how can this be sorted so having a positive mindset is extremely important because tough times will come but then they would also go i would say that another thing would be um cost management and again maybe because me i'm an ijebu girl for anybody that is here that does not know ijebu like i'm very big on cost management right um and that's one of the things that has also helped in um in these times um another would be be flexible and adaptive and adaptable right so be flexible so yes you've been doing business this way but don't be so stuck in your ways that if there are new ways or new ideas that can help improve your productivity your efficiency effectiveness please go that route and um, just look at it and um, be sure that it's something that would work but then be open-minded i think that that's like you know what i wanted to say um another will be um yeah i think that those are like three things that i would just you know like to highlight i'm sure that Adrat and inka would give us more insights all right thank you very much moreni k so this will be our last question for all the panelists before we start asking um questions from the attendees Okay, I'm going to start with um, Yinka. What advice do you have for, for small businesses that do similar or same thing as you do currently, but they are really struggling? What advice would you give? Hi, Yinka. You are muted. Now, yes. Okay. Um. First off, I I would say you need to actually sit down and be extremely honest with yourself. Is this something I really want to do? Because if it's not something you really want to do, it's not going to be easy for you. Even if it's something you want to do, it's still going to take blood, sweat, and tears. So therefore, first of all, you need to, you know, have that honest conversation with yourself. Is this something I want to do? 
And is this something I'm passionate about? And is this something that is viable? You know, you can be passionate about something and it's not viable, which is why I say you have to have a very honest conversation with yourself. Now, if you're passionate about it, that's one take. If it's viable, that's the second take. Now, what do I need to do to make this happen? A few things you can do, first of all, is this. You need to, um, first of all, ensure that you are, man I mean, how do I put it? You are providing your products at a rate that is sustainable for your business. Um, we're all guilty. All product-based um, all, all, all product based businesses struggle at this point in time to increase cost. But if you have to increase cost, maintain product quality, please do so. But ensure that you're giving customers additional value. They know why they need to pay more for your products. Okay. So if you need to increase your cost, you just have to increase your cost. But don't take that excuse to increase your cost over and above what it should be because dollar is 1.5 today and is 1.7 tomorrow. The second thing I would say you do is you need to network. How do I mean? Um, if you have businesses that are similar to yours, for example, Easter is coming right now and I'm actually going to do a bundle with another Flutterwave merchant that does jam, Badagri jam, for instance. Um, you need to keep having these conversations with like-minded business owners like you, such that you guys can actually collaborate and see what value can we give to the end customer at the same time, we moving more volumes, we moving more products. So you need to collaborate with people. Like You can't do this alone. Those are the, I mean, the days of you trying to be superwoman and do things by your own are not, I mean, are not now if you want to survive this challenging time. Another thing, again, which you need to do is you need to be um, adaptable, like Marenike said. You need to be agile and see what else can we do. For instance, we provide products, but at the same time, we have a small business arm that we're trying to make do events. Why? Because we have food service people that buy our products for events. So diversify your income. Find other ways of providing, um, of providing um, services with your products such that for instance, um, what came to mind for me now is for Amelia Naturals, she has products. She can decide to say, you know what, I want to do a spa. And in that spa, I'm using primarily my products, uh, body oils or whatever for the massage treatment. It's an additional source of income. It's not too far from what she's doing, which is products, but she's extending a service arm to it. So we just need to, like, how do I say? We need to like look inwards to find ways of extending the business, providing additional value, maintaining product quality and you know um, surviving and thriving in this um, challenging times particularly if this is your nine to five this is my nine to five so therefore i don't have a choice i need to keep going and i need to find ways of of, of doing that thank you thank you very much inka adrat what about you sorry let me please let me go through the question again sorry Okay, so what advice do you have for small businesses that do similar things to what you do, but they are currently struggling? Um, I would say consistency. So I'm going to give um, an example. So the first year of running Amila, we, we struggled because I had no, I will put it that way, I had nobody and I was just doing it from my own. I wanted to build a brand organically as much as, we, as, much as I can. So I was just using Instagram and all to push. I, I know in my mind, we, we, de we developed a very good product and I was trying as much as I can to bank on that product. So the, the first year, I think towards the ending of the year in December, I was like, but I keep on pushing this business. Like, I don't think I want to go for that anymore. Then I opened um, a TikTok account and we just started posting on TikTok. I think it was a third video. The video went viral. It had like a million view. I was like, okay. So it had a million view and it reached um, US market, UK market. And that was where we got the highest of the highest of the highest order we've ever received. And I was like, oh, what about giving up earlier? So I would say it is consistency. Like we've been very consistent. We're just three years in the business, but I will always say nine years of running failed businesses made it seem like 
Amila, we are where we are today. That oh, you you blew up so fast. No, we didn't. We didn't blow up so fast. Nine years of running field businesses from fashion business to food business, modeling agency, and all actually built me as a as a brand and also. That um, I use that tool into building Amila as a brand as well. So all the ideas I had, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't do this well. Let me impute it here. So consistency for me, just be consistent. And also, I, I also think um, knowing what you're doing and at the same time research more. When we started Amila as a, as a product again, I didn't have a, I didn't have a clear direction. I just wanted to sell a product. So along the line, the first time I went to Quara to source our shea butter, I saw the process of making shea butter. It takes seven days to produce shea butter. And I was so fascinated. I was like, okay, people need to see the behind the scene. And at the same time, storytelling. Storytelling is a very important thing. Whatever product you are selling, if you are selling palm oil, if you are selling anything, tell a very good story. Apply emotion, but in a very strategic way. How? Oh, we travel to Oyo to produce our wooden bowl, for example. We make sure we carry everybody along. This is how we produce our wooden bowl in a very sustainable way. So you are in line with the brand. It feels like the brand is your friend. So the key points, consistency, storytelling, and also, I forgot to third what I mentioned. Yes, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Adrat. Hi, Morenike. We are really running out of time. Hi, Morenike. Same question for you. You are muted. You have to pardon me. <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, so Yinka and um, Ajat has said, you know, most of the things that I want to say. But I would just add, right, that um, if we, if it's possible to, um, to lean on financial support, that would be great. So there are many um, opportunities, especially like grants. Um, so try to see how you can secure it. That's like easy money that you can just pump into your business. Um, so that's very, very key. Um, if you can also seek professional guidance and it doesn't have to be someone that is expensive or professional that you have a consultant that you have to go to maybe kpm general no sometimes it might even just be your colleague it might be your friend right your friend sometimes you know our circle our circle people that we bant with that we joke with that we go to lunch and dinner with and you know create content with and just have a nice time with some of them if you check their portfolio they are you know professionals in terms of like accounting like maybe they have their acc certified their icon certified but we are not really leveraging on the you know on the expertise so you can just say oh you know what doing uh, i like to take you out for lunch i like to pick your brain here and there or please i need your favor how can you help me you know if you are if you have been a good friend it's not be hard for doing to want to you know help you look at your books and look at your numbers so you can seek professional guidance if you cannot afford the services of a consultant you can check within your circle to see okay who can who can i you know speak to that can be of help to me so those are some of the things that you know we can we can do Thank you very much. Okay, so now we'll be taking questions. Um, Omolola Julius was asking, and this is to you, uh, Morenike. She said, I'm a young lady wanting to start an interior design decoration business. I don't have the experience of the field, just a strong desire for beautiful spaces and reorganizing my family home. How can I start out in this career path? And also, how can I make people recognize me and increase sales? Thirdly, can I start a business? Can I start the business with low capital? Hmm. So I think that uh, I'll start it from the last question. There should always be like a um, entry strategy, like have an entry strategy, right? So now when I was introducing myself, I said, you know, we do both residential commercial spaces, but we didn't start out like that, right? We just started out with baby nurseries, just a room, my child's in our house, in my, my child's room in our house. And then we proceeded to now doing like living rooms, bathrooms, you know, offices, and we just grew like that. So I would say have your own entry, entry strategy 
your entry point strategy. It might be just, you know, maybe renovating a bathroom or renovating a bedroom or renovating a living room and start with that. What I did was I used my own savings to renovate my daughter's room. And then from there, I was able to, because interior is, um, is um visual appealing so i need people need to see what i have done right and so i didn't want to be sending them pinterest pictures so i needed to just do up a space so that they can have that confidence that i can do you know I, I put my money where my mouth is so i would say that so um or you just um you know keep telling people you need to keep advertising yourself you need to keep marketing yourself you need to you know on every offline online and then you'd eventually find someone you can be friends and i would say that you should even start with yourself and then progress to friends and family at least if you make a mistake friends and family they will cover you if anything happens they will they will, they will cover you in shame in love and everything i think ah, you messed up in this area and then you will learn from that and that's how i learned because i my first client was my father so i made some mistakes here and there and from there because if i did not if it was a client that i would jump to immediately that might have ruined me i'll have been so scared and scared i said you know i'm not doing it again but family, they were able to say, you know, yes, I, I can see your heart, I can see your passion, and you know, um, these are the mistakes, and these are things, these are ways that you can correct yourself. And so, I think those are some of the advices. And this person can just send me a message on Instagram. All right. How I don't know how many. I don't know how many minutes we have, but I actually have like another engagement that I have to. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> All right. Um, I really have to be fast. Okay. Um, Amila, this. Amila Naturals, that is Adrat, these questions are for you. Um, considering the wave of skincare vendors greatly increasing, how do you stay afloat with competitors? What keeps you different? What makes people come back for more? And what would you say is the most important aspect of selling your product on social media? So that's two uh, questions. Okay, so the most important thing, how we've been able to sell product on social media is again storytelling we've been we 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 are, we are very keen to storytelling a lot of people most people don't even know how they produce share butter what we've been able to do is make videos show people this is how you share butter before the last was a call this is how it is made then sorry what was the first question um the first question is how are you able to like stay afloat? What keeps you different from your competitors? What makes people come back for more? Okay, what? Well, okay. So for us, Amila is, I like to, I don't like to see, or I don't see us as a skincare brand. I keen in more to being a share butter brand. What we provide is all natural products, which is quite different from what other people, what other people are doing. And we are very transparent, very, very transparent. This is our black soap. This is how it is produced. This is where it is produced. So they, every, every of our consumer, they see the process. And what makes us unique as a brand at the same time is, um, again, um, we look for what are the weakness of our competitors? What are they doing? What are they not doing? then we lean in more to what they are not doing. How do we stay different? How the competition is good, just tap into it the right way. This is what this brand is not doing. They are not telling story. This is what we are doing. We are telling story. This is what this brand, most brands use light skin model. Amila, when you go through the page, you see majorly dark skin models. We love to represent dark skin models or dark skin people are not well represented enough we are able to, okay, this is who we are. We, we've been able to niche down. Even though our, all, all our products are for all skin type because you don't, you don't generate um, products based on um, skin color, but our own unique selling point is for black people. So I hope I've been able to answer that question. All right, thank you very much. Um, right, thank you. Hi, Ginka. Um, this question is for you. How are you able to structure um, your business when you started from finance to brand building, tax, funding, and which is more important in selling, social media or in person? Hi, Ninka. Okay, I'm back. I was muted. Okay. Um, Selling today is different from, well, selling, what I sell today is different from what I used to sell. 
So that alone needed, you know, some transitioning. I used to sell to corporates, but now I'm selling to the mass market and as well some businesses and all of that. Um, I think both online and offline selling is important. Um, online selling because it's cheap. Um, you can reach a lot more people if you sell online through the various channels that you can sell online, um, online selling. At the same time too, offline selling is equally important, particularly if it's a product that people have to experience, which is why for us, when we started out, we did a lot of pop-ups. Um, and um, sometimes when I look at my phone and I see all the pop-ups I have gone, I'm like, oh my God, you must have been on something to be able to be showing up everywhere. And that meant that I was flipping pancakes every and anywhere. Um, how do I put it? Um, I would go with, I mean, we started out going out with our gas cylinder, then eventually we, we bought griddles and all of that. What am I trying to say? You start with what you have and you would progress into other things. So, um, I, I mean, right now I can flip pancakes anywhere because I needed people to taste the product, experience the product, and then they become a loyalist. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, that's light. That's fluffy. It doesn't have the artificial taste, all that kind of stuff. So I would say selling online and offline, they're both important. So wherever, particularly if you're a product-based uh, business owner, wherever you can interact with your customers are good. Why? Because you get on-the-spot feedback. You get on-the-spot insights that if I had, um, if you had your products on the aisle of a supermarket, you don't get. But if you go for pop-ups, if you go for fairs, you get um, feedback instantly. And you know what's working, what's not working. Um, in terms of um, when we started, like I said, we started off uh, invoicing with Flutterwave and we still do invoicing with Flutterwave. Um, it's, I put it, it works. It's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, but as time goes on, then you need to scale up your business. And in scaling up your business, you need to get um, all the resources that you need to scale up your business. Like um, Renike said, look in, I mean, look internally in your circle, find people that can help you. And if you need to pay for professional help, please do. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot, it's a lot more cheaper for you to do that, um, to make sure you set up your business correct, to, set, um, to ensure you are within the regulatory, um, the regulatory, um, the regulatory indices of whatever you're doing um, to be able to do your business right. Particularly if you don't tend to be a fly by night, you want to be a household name like us. We want to be a pantry staple. Um, you need to do your business right. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much, Inka. Hi, Adrat. I have um, two questions for you. Okay, somebody said. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm a young lady trying to start out a business in fashion brand. I particularly asked you that question because <laughs> I know experience in fashion. Yes. And she said, I'm trying to put in consideration the affordability of the outfit and also trying to make profits. How do I put a balance while still making profits? Then another person said, um, Hi, Adrat. How have you been able to effectively adapt your product to meet customers' needs during the economic downturn? Okay, so I'm big, I think I will answer the question, second question. And I think one is understanding your customers. So when we wanted to increase our prices, for example, we had to do like a table. Where are all our customers? Where are they coming from? Can they afford this? So if we should increase the price, would, 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 are they still going to be able to afford it? So we, are, we, we, we were able to understand them and see where they are coming from. Who are they? And how, how I mean, sorry, and how, how accessible is it for them as well? And also, um, we're able to validate our product. So we are increasing our price by 30%, for example, now. Why should I still keep buying this product when they are alternative? And we had to, again, we had to infuse storytelling to it and to let people know that if you are support, if you're buying from us, you are supporting 20 women in Quara or in all your states that are producing our shea butter. So it's just, um, we're appealing to them. We're, um, we're applying emotions into our marketing, but at the same time, in a very strategic way. So we had to validate our product, and we also 
we constantly educate our, our customers as well. Okay, this is the reason why you need to um, ditch this product and use the natural skincare. This is the reason why your kids needs to use shea butter instead of this particular product. So we constantly validate our product and also we constantly educate our customers as well. So for the first question, which was um, the fashion part, affordability and selling, hmm. In, I feel this is 2024. Yes, you can sell affordable clothes. And how do you sell affordable clothes? That is you making the clothes yourself. And you don't have like an external bodies that are producing for you because that means you have to pay more people to produce for you. And if it is just you, you have to consider what about when demand is high? And I'm going to use again, Amila. I'm going to infuse Amila again. While the first year, I mean, the second year of running the business, I was like, okay, girl, if this happened the first year of business, are you ready for the second year of business? And what I did then was I started traveling to African countries more. So I started traveling more, learn about the African beauty ritual that they have in their countries. And at the same time, get contact. What if we are heard of share butter? In Nigeria, for example, I need an external an external source, which are um, neighboring countries like Ghana, Benin Republic, Togo, and Sierra Leone. So I started right before it happened. I need to like make it ready. So, what if your clothes go viral on TikTok and it's so affordable? I, I think I saw a girl recently on TikTok that she reviews affordable um, outfits from Nigerian brands. You see how people of 10K, 15K. What if that kind of girl actually review your product and boom, you started, you started growing and a lot of people want it. And it's just you. So you there's for me, I'm trying to maybe um Yinka can help out. I'm trying to rack my brain how you can be how your product can be affordable as much as it can, and you want to sell a lot. So affordable in Nigeria is like 5k. 10k 15k so you have to like if you're buying a crep of um a yard of crep is like 1000 or like 1005 yeah you need three yards then cost of transportation to to and fro for me i've always believed in niche down if it is just pants you know how to sew best and you can sew a pants very well and there's a demand for pants look for students and say okay you know what or look for working class people and you know that you are selling your pants for 20,000 naira. You are making, again, maybe personally, I would rather supply one customer that is paying me well, again, maybe for me, from my own perspective. And I will supply, a very, I'm very big on quality. Quality, I am very, very big on quality. So when there's a rush flow of orders and it is just you, or you people are like two or three, how do you do um, quality control? How do you make sure that people actually got what they ordered? And it won't be a situation of what I ordered versus what I got. Mm, fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Adrat. Um, this is the final question, and that's for Yinka. Um, hi, Yinka. In question of capital, what approach should, yes. one, take, should one take towards leveraging company values and ROI on getting investors? Okay, the issue of, um, I mean, I know a lot of a lot of Nigerians will say, oh, to do a business, you need capital, you need huge capital. Um, I'm not for that school of thought, because um, up till now, um, we don't have any public funds in our business. It was my savings, and we bootstrapped up till now. And I'll tell you, the, 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 the reason is, is simple. If we took investment at that time, we will be shortchanged. Because it would be like, you haven't done the business for a while. We're taking a risk. We want 80% of your business or some no change. So what I would tell anybody trying to start a business out is, um, you don't need to look for big funds at first. Um, if you have savings, you can use that. I'm not saying use your entire savings and go hungry, no. Or go homeless, no. Um, and another thing you can do again is you can have crowdfunding friends and family that believe a lot in you, um, they can actually donate to the cause. Obviously, um, not for free, make sure you're giving them something in return. 
um, for their trust in you and for taking a risk with you, taking a chance with you. Um, we all know that um, interest rates in Nigeria are not friendly, it's in the 20 something percent. Um, so I would not encourage anybody at this time starting out a business to go seek for a loan because you're not even sure at what rate the loan would end up by the time the dollar is flying up and down and then they're reviewing MMR on a daily basis. And, you know, before you know it, you're just working for the bank. So I would say, first of all, um, try and operate your business on a very realistic um, um, you don't need to have a huge office if you don't need to have a huge office. Um, you can actually um, start out as a small-scale industry and apply um, for permits for that category of business. And as time goes on, you can scale up, you know. Um, if you have a B, you can scale up. You don't have to start off like Coca-Cola if you're making drinks. Um, Coca-Cola didn't start off at Coca-Cola at that time as well. So you need to be extremely honest with yourself when you're doing business. Uh, business because you see there's a huge risk in doing business um we have been fortunate and blessed you know to have started it out and we're here to know. It's, it's not the same thing for everybody and i like the fact that amida was very honest that she's done some business before in the past of nine years and it wasn't really um going anywhere and then she started doing the share butter business and it's booming you know so those are real stories and i think we should take this into consideration. So don't go saddle yourself with a huge financial expense. No, don't do that. Um, start out your business as um, small as you can, because every business in the first place starts with an idea. First of all, you have to validate the idea. Is the idea even valid? I mean, valid. First of all, again, you might be passionate about it. You have to validate the idea, and then you try out the idea, and then you're sure it's something that can be commercialized. You know, um, you can't um, just say you have this uh, eureka idea and you want to pump 10, 20 million into it, it doesn't work that way. You would burn your fingers before you know it. So I would say um, start out small, obviously having big, I mean, big, big goals in front of you or having, I mean, start small, but think big. That's what they say, start small, think big. And in starting small and thinking big, put structures that enable you compete as well with the known brands. And you take it one day at a time, you know, one day at a time, to get into where you want to go. Uh, we started out with one product, uh, and then today we have well over 10, 15 products in our Flutterwave store. Um, you don't start out with 15 products in one day. Amila to say she started with one product, and over time she grew. Um, so therefore, um, baby steps, um, baby steps, uh, validate what you're doing. Um, I'm a person of faith. Um, commit everything to God's hand, um, and then um, we pray that everything turns out well. Thank you very Sorry, much. I have just one thing to what she said. Okay, so the link Sorry, goes just is it's going to yes, yes. So yes. for for me, I started Amila with just fifty thousand mm -hmm. and after three years, I can say Amila is running like a multi millionaire, multi million business. Actually, no external investor, nothing. When you get an investor, there's so much pressure on you. Like investors are all about numbers they are all about the money when you have passion for whatever you're trying to build you are goal driven you know the direction that you are going to but if investors we put so much pressure on you that oh how can we sell 1000 share butter in a month and you are there you've collected money you don't have a choice you have to keep pushing so i again maybe from experience personal experience i say this every now and then we started with just fifty thousand era and it has grown consistency and storytelling. Those two things are the most Thank important you. thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. This, this was Thank such you. an insightful session. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, the video recording will go live on our YouTube and we can't wait to have you again. Thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you. Inka, Adrat, Morelli, K, and to all attendees, thank you so much. We hope you find this very, very insightful. Please, when the video is up, please share with your friends, please share with your loved ones. And yeah, thank you so much, guys. Do have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.